morning, everybody. Uh, pastor asked me a few weeks ago, like he just said, uh, share something um, about the Roman series, and I felt bad because a couple of Sundays I wasn't around. <laughs> um, but he was very encouraging. Uh, he told me to share what really touched me uh, from this series, from what he has been um, sharing with us, what God has been talking to us about. And I think, let me just read you a verse which was probably the one that clicked the most. And I, I, and I think this was because maybe, I think this was uh, in, the s in the title of the sermon, was it was counted. Um, and this was probably earlier of the month when this whole social distancing, the pandemic, it was still very, very hot, well, still hot topic, but it was very, very hot. Anyway, it's um, Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. And um, these verses actually really touched me because, um, well, let me also explain that. I think pastor always shares one message every week. But there are hundreds of stories being heard because we all tend to relate it to ourselves in whichever way we see fit or whichever way that really connected with us. So I was, I mean, I work in the event management business and as you can imagine, there is no business at this point of time. Much like the travel industry, this is a, you can't gather more than 30 people, right? Um, and for that, then no one's going to do any events. So, so it's a bit stressful, a bit worrying. Um, but, but I think like I was sharing I related this to my work because um, I, 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 I was looking at this series of um, advertisements. Uh, this was actually shared by, uh, in a workshop that I was, uh, was on. Um, if you look at all the biggest brands, Apple, Google, Facebook, everyone, they're all running all these advertisements that we're in this together. Uh, we will get through this. Uh, we will have a new normal. We will... And, and the tone and manner of all these advertisements were dark, gloomy, sad. Because it's true, it's a difficult time, right? And they were hoping to connect to their audience, um, their consumers, their target audience in this sense. Um, but I think the very uh, uh, interesting approach was this person who actually then highlighted an ad that Colgate was running. Um, Colgate being toothpaste, it's all a series of smiles across the world, right? Um, they showed people in Zoom smiling. They showed uh, people in lockdown smiling. They showed people at home smiling. It was essentially the same message, right? It was still that we are in this together across the world. Uh, we are all having difficult times. We're all at home. But smile because you can. Smile while you can. And it had a very, very positive uh, outcome, right, this particular ad, because they didn't actually remind you of the bad times. Instead, they told you to think of the good times, right? And, and in this um, verse that I read about us being blessed, I think this is something, this is where it connected the most to me because I realized that we always, we ask for a lot of blessings. We do get blessed a lot. I think the fact that we're all here, the, all, the fact that we're all, especially a church being a church with all foreigners, we're all in Vietnam, the safest, if not one of the safest countries from, none of us are here because we saw a hit and said, wow, this coronavirus is getting bad, I better go to Vietnam. We're all here because we're here for whatever reasons God put us here. And that alone is a blessing already, right? We're all in this country where it's so safe. Life is almost back to normal. If, if you I mean, minus the international travel, life is almost back to normal for 70, 80% of us, right? So, so I, I think really what touched me at this point was um, when I read, when Pastor was sharing about, I know the title was that we, we were count, accounted for and all that, um, but it was really about the blessings that we have that I think we don't realize, that we take for granted, um, that we forget to thank God for, um, and to close, I think um, what triggered, what really made me think, which is hopefully something will help make you all think also, is what am I going to do with these blessings now? Because 
God blessed me with a healthy family. I have three beautiful children, um, a loving wife. Um, life is going on um, well. And, and with these blessings, what am I going to do with it? Right? It's something that I try to, I try to remember every day that, that you know, um, besides the fact that I tend to forget <laughs> of being thankful of, on the, of these blessings, but what am I going to do or what am I going to say or, what am I, or how am I going to live my life that will make use of these blessings? Right? So, so yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to share. All right, thank you, David. All right, Peter, uh, please welcome Peter. He's going to share with us a few words. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you, Pastor, for giving me this opportunity to share. Uh, so I'll just be sharing my reflections, as David mentioned, on Romans 4. Um, hopefully it's a blessing and encouragement to all of you. So Romans 4 is a wonderful chapter that provides a basis for us Gentiles, right, to feel connected to the faith that Abraham professed and to be able to call him our spiritual forefather. And the chapter demonstrates that we are a part of the covenant that God made with Abraham and that we are also justified through faith and blessed through hope in God's goodness, just as Abraham was. And this is great news because without salvation through faith, we would have to follow God's law to the letter. And at least I know I fall very well short of that. And as pastor would like to say, we would all be doomed or doomers, right? So studying this chapter made me reflect upon how I relate to God, whether I claim salvation through faith and seek God's blessing through trust and reliance on him rather than on, my, on the law and on my own merits. And upon reflection, I realized that it depends. How, how I relate to God really depends on my circumstances. You know, for salvation, I'm fully convinced that I cannot attain it on my own. So it's not difficult for me to wholly rely on faith. But what about God's blessings, like a successful career, abundant finances, worldly comforts, good friends, even a future spouse. For God, for, I'm sorry, for Abraham, God's blessing meant becoming the father of many nations. And let me read Romans 4, 18 to 22 to see how Abraham sought God's blessing. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. It says he did not weaken in faith and that no unbelief made him waver. And he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. But realistically, not to devalue Abraham's faith, you know, since his body was as good as dead and Sarah was barren, his only choices were actually to have faith and see if God comes through or blow off God's promise as baloney. You know, how can old people like us have children? And we actually know that Romans 4 isn't the full story. And we are given more of his story to know that he was not perfect. In Genesis, there's a a little bit about Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarah at the time, trying to rely on their own strength and resources to have a son. So let me read for you Genesis 16, 1 through 6. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, my, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked at me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, 
Your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. And the placement of the story is quite interesting. It's sandwiched between two events in which God makes a covenant with Abraham. The story comes right after chapter 15, which describes God and Abraham holding a, a little ceremony to establish their covenant. And God promises Abraham a son. This is a story with the smoking pot and torch passing by the blood. It also comes right before chapter 17, which depicts the covenant of the circumcision that God makes with Abram when he's 99 years old. And God specifically promises a son through Sarai, now named Sarah. So while chapters 15 and 17 are full of dialogue between God and Abraham, God is silent in chapter 16, maybe drowned out by the voices of Abram, Sarai, and Hagar. And what's more, God makes it clear in 17 that it was not his intention to fulfill his promise through Ishmael, the, Abram, the son Abram born uh, with Hagar. So to me, the story reminds me of the way I sometimes make the promises of God come to pass using my own will and strength. And I'm most tempted to do this when it seems like I have the capacity and resources to make something happen, and when it seems like God's been silent and inactive for a while. And I become tempted to live a righteous life trying to earn bargaining chips to cash in with God by doing good things. And I tell myself that the choices and the intention that, uh, intentions that I have are based on biblical principles and in accordance with God's law. So surely, he should be willing to accept and approve my choices, right? And to help me attain what I'm seeking. But actually, I, I should note that there's a difference between doing our best while trusting in God's way and timing and doing our best while trusting in our own merits. And for me, the way I know which I'm doing is how I feel when things don't work out. <laughs> when things don't work out, I get angry at God. And the reason I get angry is because I felt like I earned whatever I thought I, God had promised me. And I tried to do everything to fulfill God's promise, but it looks like he's denying me what's rightfully mine. And this is not holding strong in faith. And it means I'm not fully convinced that God is able to do what he had promised, at least in the way and time I wanted it. And so when I work on the basis of my own strength, things don't always turn out well, and I end up hurting myself and others just like how Abram's and Sarai's choices uh, cause a lot of strife within their family and between Ishmael's and Isaac's households and generations to come. So Romans 4 then makes me reflect, why was Abraham held up as a model, even though he made this mistake? And I think Abraham's story ultimately ends with him learning patience and having complete reliance on God. And more importantly, Abraham comes to a point where God becomes more important to him than God's promise itself. The ultimate demonstration of this is Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. So upon reflecting upon Romans 4, it challenged me to have faith in God, not because I want some promises fulfilled, but because I want to grow in relationship with him and to come to love him as much as Abraham did, to consistently direct my heart, to say wholeheartedly to God, uh, you're all I want, you're all I ever needed, as you sang this morning. And it'll be a process to get to that point, but I pray that God will help you and me to examine our relationship with him continuously and to refocus on him whenever we, in our weakness, pursue a promise rather than pursuing God. Thank you.